Hi, this is Robert Shear with another edition of Shear Intelligence, and where I, I obviously the intelligence comes to my guest, so this would be an exercise in extreme uh, megalomania. Uh, but I, I really mean it here uh, with Juan Cole. I, I have interviewed him, I think, going way back to when I was writing columns at the LA Times. I actually, uh, I wasn't a contemporary of his, I was much older, but when he was studying with Nikki Ketty uh, and an expert on I Iran, uh, and he knew Farsi, he knows Arabic. He's written a great book on Muhammad that I cite all the time, trying to teach and putting the, the real life Muhammad in as a, actually a figure of uh, tolerance, uh, somebody who had to do trade with different tribes, different religions, and so forth. I think it's sort of the best book I've read on the subject. But the reason I want to talk to you today, on, I, I, I'm despairing about what's happening uh, in the Mideast. I, I, I was there at the time of the Six-Day War, and my goodness, I was much more optimistic about peace then by far than now. I don't know if Israel's bent on and get rid of every Palestinian around, if this is really ethnic cleansing in the extreme. I don't know what's happening. Is this also the destruction of, of Lebanon as a kind of a center of cosmopolitan life in, in the Arab world. So take it from there. I mean, how momentous is is this time? Well, it is a big turning point, I think, in the uh, in the fate of Israel, the fate of the Middle East, the United States. Uh, you know, you said you were there in '67 during the Six Day War. That was the turning point. That was when the Israelis uh, captured the Palestine territories uh, in Gaza and the West Bank. And uh, it was, um, it set up the current dynamic because, you know, uh, when Israel was formed in, in 1948, uh, it's, it, it came out of a civil war on the one hand and of a rebellion against the British colonial authorities on the other. And in the course of that, those events, uh, something like 750,000 Palestinians were uh, kicked out of their homes in what became Israel and weren't allowed ever to come back or to get any reparations for their property. Uh, and many of them settled in the West Bank or were driven into Gaza. Uh, but uh, Israel, as it, as it was formed, became accepted by the United Nations and uh, gained the support of the United States uh, and there was some hope that eventually the Palestinians would have a state of their own in the West Bank and Gaza alongside Israel. So they wouldn't remain stateless because they, they lost their citizenship in a state uh, when the Israelis displaced them. They're the largest population of people that don't have citizenship in a state. If you're stateless, you have no real rights. You don't have a indigenous court that you can go before. Uh, if you have claim property, people can steal it from you. And who would you complain to? Uh, you don't know what you own. Uh, and uh, so the Israelis put the Palestinians in this condition of statelessness and have kept them there. And uh, the right wing in Israel has determined that the Palestinians will never have a state. Uh, and it doesn't really care under what conditions they live. Uh, and that situation is unsustainable. You can't keep millions of people in a condition of statelessness and without basic human rights forever. Uh, and of course, it's going to cause trouble if people can't get uh, their basic rights by peaceful means, then they'll re resort to violence. And so we've seen a lot of violence. Uh, it comes out of the situation, it's structural. And now, uh, the current government in Israel, having been challenged on the sustainability of its policies towards the Israelis on October 7th last year, uh, has decided that, you know, they had kept the Palestinians in kind of a big jail. Uh, they decided that that jail was not maximum security enough. So they're constructing a new and uh, a more thorough maximum security prison for the Palestinians in Gaza and in the West Bank. Uh, and uh, they are attempting to reshape regional politics in Lebanon and elsewhere uh, to allow them 
to make that maximum security prison for the Palestinians and forestall them ever having a state or citizenship of any sort. So just to be clear, because it's interesting in reading about this, listening to television, radio, what have you, the most salient fact has been obliterated, which is that Israel came to occupy this territory, uh, the Golan Heights, part of Jerusalem, uh, the West Bank and Gaza. Uh, and, and, and everybody thinks either they had it all along or uh, it was necessary because they were attacked in the Six Day War and then they grabbed this land. But uh, as someone who did visit that region, uh, very soon after the ending of the war, I arrived actually at Cairo Airport and I saw the very clear evidence that this was a preemptive war. And in fact, Israel had been able to destroy what existed of the Egyptian Air Force in some three hours or something. I saw the evidence of it at the airport. They actually even didn't have to bomb dummy planes. They just got the real planes. And the whole David and Goliath image of Israel is this besieged, tiny nation with all these powerful, unified Arab countries was nonsense from the beginning. And, and it, it was really quite ironic to me, and but also to many Israelis I encountered. Uh, at that time, I went to Israel after about a month and a half in Egypt, and I felt, uh, frankly, very much at home, certainly in Tel Aviv, uh, uh, as a Jewish person, but also as a progressive. Most of the Israelis I met, including people who were officers in the military and very prominent people, uh, I had, had been the editor of Ramparts magazine. They admired the journalism. We were, had no trouble having conversation. And I know we've talked about this before, but I can't get it out of my head. Most of the people I talked to were on the left, were largely secular, and said, if we occupy these people and you come back, and sometimes they said 10 years, some even said five years, and we're still occupying these people. It's not an Israel that I would want to live in, not me, them. And, and there seemed to be, at least in the circles I went moved into, and I believe I even stayed in a kibbutz uh, that was attacked this time, not sure, but I know I stayed in, in, in a, a kibbutz of people who, in, in that movement, who were also on the left, Hashemir Hatzair, and so forth, left Zionists, who, who said that with some with real conviction. How did we get to this thing now, where the assumption of the occupation is being valid, is not challenged even in progressive circles? Uh, I, I don't get that. Uh, I mean, how did history? Uh, do I have my history wrong? Was I? Tell me. Well, I mean, there certainly there, there was a, a, a significant Israeli left, but they weren't in power. The people that you were talking to uh, weren't the ones who planned out the, the 67 war, which was, uh, uh, as you say, a preemptive war. It was launched by Israel. It wasn't launched by Egypt. The is Israelis fired the first shot. And there had been people in the Israeli military who had been... Uh, tasked with thinking about how could you grab the West Bank and Gaza and the Golan Heights for the previous 10 years. That, that, that This was uh, something that they had wanted, that they schemed at, uh, and uh, launching this war gave them a pretext to do it. So, I, I mean, I think we have to understand that the center of power in Israel, uh, Ben-Gurion and people uh, around him, uh, and his successors, uh, many of them were expansionists. Uh, they didn't think Israel, as it existed uh, in 1948, was large enough uh, to survive. Uh, they worried that, you know, one, there's a place uh, in, in that old Israel where a foreign tank uh, regiment could uh, cut the country in half because there was only 10 kilometers from the from the. Palestinian border of the West Bank uh, to the Mediterranean. Uh, and so if you think in terms of uh, sort of tank warfare, the country was vulnerable. So Ben-Gurion wanted uh, southern Lebanon to be added to it. Uh, he wanted the Sinai Peninsula in Egypt. Uh, and he kept trying to get those things. That was the point of the, of the 56 and the 67 wars, which were both launched by Israel 
as attempts to expand. So this was a rogue state. I mean, it, it was an expansionist state. And in 67, those people who were expansionists got what they wanted. There were other Israelis who didn't ap approve or didn't agree, but they were not in power. And then uh, the country moved to the right. Uh, the, the, the sort of leftist uh, Central European Ashkenazi Jews who dominated the country after its founding uh, gradually were supplanted or challenged, uh, and new forces came on on, uh, on the scene. So in 1977, uh, uh, a decade after you were there, uh, the Likud party came to power for the first time, uh, very with very significant support from uh, the Mizrahim, from the uh, Jews of Middle Eastern origin, from Moroccans and Tunisians and Iranians and, and so forth, and Iraqis. Uh, and uh, they were not on the left for the most part. Uh, they were uh, often working class. They felt that the old Ashkenazi establishment had uh, kept them in the cold. Uh, and uh, they had sometimes demonstrated about being marginalized. Uh, and they... Uh, had grievances against the Arab world because many of them were uh, attacked by mobs and had to flee for their lives after the establishment of Israel. There was a reaction against Jews who were unfairly blamed for its rise uh, throughout the, the Middle East. So they felt that they had been attacked, they had lost everything, they had no sympathy with the Palestinians, and they were hungry for land. They were hungry for resources because the Ashkenazis had the best houses. And a place like the West Bank, which could be colonized, uh, had, had a lot of land that could be appropriated and uh, uh, houses built for them. Uh, so the rise of the, of the uh, Eastern Jews in Israel was an important uh, consideration. And in the 1990s, after the fall of the East Bloc and the Soviet Union, a million people came to Israel, uh, many of them only very tenuously Jewish, uh, and uh, uh, they uh, f formed political parties uh, like uh, Israel Beitenu, uh, uh, led by Avigdor Lieberman, uh, which are uh, well, essentially fascist parties. I mean, they 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 went the same direction. As as Hungary and and uh, some some other parts of the of the uh, of Eastern Europe, uh, towards towards the far right, uh, and so the Israel that exists now with the rise of the Mizrahim and the rise of the uh, of the uh, ex Soviet uh, Jews, uh, all jostling for uh, a living in Israel, where, which is a very ex expensive country to live in. Um, hungry for resources, hungry for territory. Uh, that's, not, that's not the old Israel of the, of the leftist kibbutzim. Uh, those guys are, are long gone. And uh, I, I, I stayed in a kibbutz uh, near Ben-Gurion uh, uh, University uh, near Be Beersheba, uh, which was in the process of being privatized. And most of them are being privatized. Uh, the, the old socialist Israel is gone. Uh, and the Labour Party gets hardly any seats in Parliament. And not only has the country shifted to the right, it's shifted to the far right. I mean, you have people in the cabinet like, like Itamar Ben-Gavir and, uh, uh, you know, others of, of, of uh, um, I mean, who, who would probably make uh, Viktor Orban blush with the extremism of their views, Uh uh, Betzalel, Smotrich, and, and so forth. They talk openly about ethnically cleansing the Palestinians, uh, about uh, leveling uh, 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 nearby countries like like Lebanon, uh, and um, uh, and and expanding. Uh, and they call themselves Jewish power. I and mean, they're 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 like our white nationalists and the Jewish nationalists, Jewish extreme nationalists. Uh, so that's who's in the cockpit right now. That those are people who, who you know, have a veto over the government. And uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is on the the pretty far right himself. But these guys are are uh, way to his right. But he is thrown in with them, and he's uh, a wily uh, 
politician with apparently no principles whatsoever. And he's perfectly happy to have thrown in with them. And uh, they're getting him uh, what he wants, which is to remain in power. Uh, so from the Israeli point of view of Israeli society, uh, this is a new ball game. This, this is an aggressive uh, fascist Israel. Uh, and many uh, mainstream Israelis are very afraid of this government. Women are afraid that they'll be made to sit in the back of the bus. Uh, gays are afraid that, of being attacked. Uh, uh, Smotrich has called them, you know, similar to uh, bestiality. Uh, and, uh, the, uh, you know, th there's a, a rise of, of estimation for uh, uh, rabbis. You know, some people think Iran is, is, is becoming a knockoff of, of Iran's Islamic Republic. So th this is important for people to consider because uh, the Israel that I have in my uh, memory is one that was easy for American liberal people uh, and uh, Jews and non-Jews to embrace uh, people on the progressive side of things, including what were then moderate Republicans and others, is a, a basically uh, a, a place of tolerance and uh, where, uh, you know, the notion of the, of the Jewish people as a tolerant people came out of oppression, came out of, uh, you know, suffering anti-Semitism, and therefore, you know, uh, the great most of the great Jewish writers and cultural figures were uh, advocates uh, of tolerance, you know, whether it was Hannah Arendt or Albert Einstein or many, many others, Leonard Bernstein, what have you. And uh, something changed here, and it affects American politics, because right now the Israel that you described is one that it's easy for Trump to embrace, but a little more awkward for Democratic politicians to embrace, uh, ever more so by the increase of violence connected with a, a nationalism for Israel. And you saw that even when Netanyahu came to Congress, the people who sort of were not there were mostly Democrats, and the Republicans were quite happy with Netanyahu. Is this, you know, going forward, uh, particularly as the violence and the charge of genocide can be now uh, more supportable uh, as, uh, as a description, where, where does this leave American politics? Yeah, well, the, it's very clear that uh, most members of the Democratic Party, and including American Jews in very large numbers, are disgusted with uh, with Netanyahu's policies, and the, the support for Israel has has fallen dramatically uh, among them, especially young people, uh, and 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 again, including uh, young American Jews. Uh, so uh, yes, uh, Israel had benefited from being a bipartisan uh, commitment. Uh, both Democrats and Re Republicans were committed to it. Uh, that's changing now. It's becoming a partisan uh, football. Uh, and um, uh, there are Democrats who are beginning to be highly critical of Israel. Uh, and, uh, you know, the Progressive Caucus of about 60 members of Congress uh, in, uh, on the Democratic side, uh, I think they all believe that, that Israel is committing a genocide. Uh, and uh, are concerned about the degree to which the United States government is, is supporting uh, these actions. Uh, so yes, uh, I think it's not a good uh, it's not a good development for the Israelis, uh, and it's not a good development for uh, for anybody, uh, including uh, Jewish Americans, some of whom, you know, are unfairly now being tagged as genocidaires as uh, uh, as supporting all of this, even though. Uh, it, it's not clear at all that most American Jews are on board with what Netanyahu is doing. Um, and so, you know, the, the American Jewish establishment back in the 90s wouldn't meet with Likudniks. They wouldn't meet with people from Netanyahu's party. Uh, Ariel Sharon couldn't get a hearing when he was, uh, uh, before he was prime minister back in the 90s. Uh, so uh, the, 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 the organized Israel lobby, of the American Israel uh, Public Affairs Committee, APAC, uh, is has has shifted to the far right along with Netanyahu, but the uh, and 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 some of the very wealthy members of the community 
uh, are all on board the 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 Adelsons with their casino money and uh, and, and so forth. But I would say that the average uh, Jewish American in the street uh, is not at all happy with this situation. You know, obviously, the October seventh attacks were horrific, and uh, every, I think everybody in America felt uh, uh, supportive of Israel at that moment. But the things that have happened in the aftermath uh, have have been unacceptable uh, to most Americans, and I, I think most most Jewish Americans. Uh, so that you know, I, I think. Kamala Harris's uh, diction about it, that Israel has the right to defend itself, but it matters how, is uh, a, a very widespread sentiment. And there are people who are, are much more vehement than that, of course. Uh, so yes, you, you've put your finger on an important issue. It's also the case that Netanyahu is obviously attempting to draw the United States into another war in the Middle East uh, with Iran this time. And were he to succeed, and were it to go badly, and I think inevitably it would go badly, uh, there's danger of, of, of that feeding into anti-Semitism as well as you know, the Jews dragged us into this thing and, and so forth. So it's a, an extremely explosive moment. Yeah, and you, well, you make an interesting point because those uh, Jewish people, myself included, and many of the people that I know and talk to uh, uh, and so forth, we're caught in a crosshairs here because if you dare criticize Israel, you're a self-hating Jew, and yet we're also held accountable for everything Israel does by uh, anti-Semites. So, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, lose-lose. But but I, I want to take you, you're, uh, we, I mean, I promised you and others that we would uh, keep this to a half hour <laughs> and in the hopes that I'll be able to get you again to keep up on on this and, and subsequent podcasts. But I at first encountered you as one of the really interesting and in, and most informed observers of Iran that I knew of when I was working at the Los Angeles Times. And uh, you were fluent in the language and the history. You studied under a, a great professor, Nikki, Eddie, uh, Nikki Kitty, right? Do I have it right? Yes. That's correct. Yeah. And, and, uh, I, and, and you just made so much sense about it. And, and I thought about it today because and I'm thinking about Kamala Harris. Because first of all, she did give a significant speech uh, in uh, Selma uh, and where she preceded her speech by talking about the situation in Gaza and West Bank in very human terms about the suffering that it had to be dealt with. And she clearly has a sensibility in that direction. On the other hand, she's moved more hawkish and, and so forth in, in during the course of this campaign. But today, and I didn't fully absorb the statement, but I, I gathered from what I read so far, she sort of singled out Iran as our biggest enemy. And for people who don't understand anything of the history of Iran, if it's, that's our biggest enemy, it's an enemy that U.S. foreign policy uh, created uh, you know, we're just uh, going back to the overthrow of the last secular leader uh, of Iran, which is now 75 years ago or something, uh, Mohammad Mossadegh, and, and how we installed the Shah and created all these conditions and so forth. How should we think about Iran right now? And they've gone through some changes. They have sort of a more moderate elected leader now, but uh, bring bring us up to date. And what is how is Israel going to fare? You say it won't end well, but they think they're going to have a swift victory and just get rid of uh, the Islamic State, right? Yeah, well, they, you know, a lot of people told us we'd have a quick victory over uh, the Iraq and uh, we would, uh, the Middle East would turn glorious if only we got rid of Saddam Hussein. Uh, the United States has the, the most high-tech and most capable military in the world and certainly could defeat a conventional Iranian force. But uh, Iran is three times geographically larger than Iraq and uh, two and a half times more populous than it was uh, th th than Iraq. And uh, so um, if things didn't go well for the United States in its eight and a half year occupation of Iraq, imagine how badly things would go in Iran. It's a, a, a much bigger, uh, uh, more populous uh, a country, which is frankly also more technologically advanced than Iraq was. Uh, so uh, the, the guerrilla resistance would be fierce and, and effective. 
uh, I- Iran has a by now a long history of opposing Western imperialism, and it's been put in a very difficult position by Netanyahu's uh, aggressive actions. Uh, Iran uh, supports the, the Palestinians and their their demand for uh, uh, citizenship in a state. Uh, it, it seems to favor a one-state solution in which there are just Palestinians and Israelis would jointly elect a government. Uh, that's the kind of thing that they say, uh, which the Israelis view as a call for the liquidation of Israel because it's an ethno-nationalist state. If it's not a, a Jewish state, then, then it's not Israel. Uh, but the, 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 the Iranians are not saying that the Jews should be killed or that uh, anything should be liquidated. Uh, um, some of them are anti-Semites and, and do speak uh, horribly about uh, about the Jews of Israel. But uh, the, the main figures of the government uh, have, have had this uh, one-state solution sort of uh, rhetoric. But they support the Palestinians. Uh, they have supported uh, the Hezbollah, the, the Shiite uh, party militia of southern Lebanon. And yes, I think that you have to see Iran and, uh, and, and Hezbollah as reactive uh, to Israeli expansionism, uh, the uh, the Israelis occupied ten uh, percent of Lebanese soil, uh, southern Lebanon, for uh, eighteen years, uh, and uh, the the Lebanese wanted them right back out of their country. Uh, they didn't want to be occupied, and the Shiites of southern Lebanon, who, who nobody ever heard of them, you know, in the wider world uh, before Israel occupied that uh, area. Uh, threw up these resistant movement, resistance movements like Hezbollah. Uh, it was Israel that radicalized the Shiites of, of, of southern Lebanon. Uh, and it. There, there's an important point, if I could just stop you. Could you tell us a little bit about that history? Uh, is this where Hezbollah comes from? Yeah. Hezbollah was formed in 1984, two years after the Israelis invaded southern Lebanon. Uh, the, 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 the Lebanon is a multicultural country. It has Christians, it has Sunni Muslims, it has Shiite Muslims, it has Druze, which are an offshoot ultimately of the Shiites. Uh, uh, it, it has Eastern Orthodox Christians. Uh, it used to have Jews. Uh, and uh, it, it um, uh, its its constituent parts are very finely balanced in the national uh, elections and institutions. Uh, but... Um, the Israelis in 1947 and 48 uh, expelled large numbers of Palestinians north to Lebanon, and the, the Lebanese couldn't accept them as immigrants. They couldn't give them citizenship because they were mostly uh, Sunni uh, Muslims, and it would have given extra numbers to the Sunnis, and it would have unbalanced the whole system. So the Palestinians in Lebanon have lived without citizenship, uh, without property rights, without the right to work uh, in in refugee camps and squalid conditions ever since uh, 1948. Uh, and and uh, I've spoken to some of them in camps. They they all want to go back to their homes in what is now Israel, uh, and. Um, they formed uh, the Palestine Liberation Organization. Uh, they joined it in some numbers uh, and started striking at Israel in the 70s. Uh, and the Israelis hit back at, at Lebanon. They, they didn't just hit back at the Palestinians in Lebanon, but they hit back at, at Lebanon proper. Uh, and the Christians in Lebanon really minded uh, that the Palestinians were using Lebanon as a base to, to hit at Israel. And a civil war broke out in 75 between uh, the right-wing Christians and the Palestinians and their allies. Uh, and uh, that war went on uh, uh, for uh, until 1989. And in the midst of the war, in 1982, Israel uh, invaded Lebanon w- uh, with the hope of destroying the PLO, destroying the Palestine Liberation Organization, uh, and uh, propping up uh, the right-wing Christians and, and reshaping Lebanese politics. Um, the candidate- these right-wing Christians, as I recall, uh, had a ma- created a massacre of Palestinians. Yes, at, at uh, Sabra and Shatila, uh, mm-hmm. the, the Israelis gave the task of guarding this Palestinian camp to the right-wing Christians, uh, and the right-wing Christians committed a, a massacre there. 
Uh, the Israelis have recently been bombing in that area, and people are fleeing Sabra and Shatila as we speak. Uh, so the bad memories are coming back up. So, you know, Hezbollah formed because of the Israeli occupation of southern Lebanon, because of this invasion. And the Israelis just stayed. They stayed uh, uh, and, and the Hezbollah formed and began hitting them with guerrilla tactics. They would snipe at them. They would set off bombs. They would engage in suicide bombing, which they picked up from the Tamil Tigers in, in Sri Lanka. Uh, and um, they, they succeeded in 2000 in, in forcing the Israelis back out. Uh, and the right wing in Israel has always minded uh, that, uh, that that uh, Ehud Barak, the then prime minister, gave up this territory in, in Lebanon and let Hezbollah uh, push them out. Uh, it's one of the reasons they're determined now to destroy Hezbollah, uh, to throw Lebanon, from their point of view, they have hopes of throwing it back into civil war, maybe get enlisting some of the Lebanese to help destroy Hezbollah. And then uh, putting in a government uh, that uh, that they like. It's, a, it's 1982 all over again. 1982 was an enormous failure, and it produced more radicalization and more headaches in the long term for Israel. And it caused the Shiites in southern Lebanon to ally with Iran, uh, which wasn't, uh, you know, many of them were not with Khomeini initially. Uh, so this will be this will just be more trouble, uh, more more th th this uh, kind of. Um, uh, Big think of uh, of Netanyahu that he can just reshape uh, the, the countries around him militarily. Uh, it, it's all going to end very badly. Yeah, and it also shows the limits of of Netanyahu's politics. Because after all, when this all started, there had been the Abraham Accords that Trump's uh, son-in-law had helped negotiate, right? And there was going to be uh, a reaching out to. Uh, conservative Arab states and the Emirates and Saudi Arabia and so forth. And now, by expanding the war into Lebanon, it's not just the Palestinians in the West Bank of Gaza, but this is a, really an assault on the large part of Arab uh, society in other countries. And uh, Lebanon's a very important country culturally and uh, in the Im imagination of people, as I recall. And I'm just wondering whether this this can be turned back now to would, would Saudi Arabia would these Emirates would they actually uh, normalize relations with Israel now after this has happened and while it's so unsettled? I mean, is there a cost here? Because oh all, yeah, no, yeah. that process of normalization is dead in the water. And, you know, these elites are corrupt and uh, they might be inveigled into making some deal with Israel, but uh, th th their people are furious. I mean, I, I, Americans have no idea because our news uh, uh, system is broken. And, and so what's going on in the Middle East is not actually being reported on. But uh, if, if you just did a walk around interview of your average Arab on the street, they are furious. They're livid. They're really, they would shout at you uh, about a, a genocide in Gaza, an invasion of Lebanon. So the, the king of, uh, the, the crown prince in Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman, who we think is actually running things, has been pressed by the Biden administration all this, uh, these last few months to, to make uh, uh, this uh, Abraham Accords type deal with uh, Israel. And uh, uh, Mohammed bin Salman would tell the Americans when they came, yes, yes, that's what I want, and so forth. But recently, he's, he start let, started letting them know the real score, which is that he said he's afraid of being assassinated if he went through with that. Wow. Uh, and he's afraid of his own people, and he has right to be. Uh, the, the American policies are, are, uh, are, are crazy uh, from the point of view of, of people in the Middle East, the idea of, 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 of anybody making peace with Netanyahu under these circumstances. So M MBS has said, well, you know, let the Israelis uh, accept a Palestinian state and then I'll make peace. Well, that's what King Abdullah had said in 2002. We're back to that. But also at the same time, it's not just, in, uh, not just it's critical what happens in the rest of the neighboring countries, but also at the UN uh, there's, I mean, uh, uh, now, I mean, and including, I mean, even now in terms of whether you should sell 
uh, offensive weapons or give offensive weapons to Israel. Even France, Macron has uh, pulled back. Uh, and at the UN, I forget the number, it's 135 nations or something that voted to condemn Israel. And uh, yet there is an idea, that, uh, and this is where I don't understand. If one cares about the situation of Jewish people, which after all was the justification, it wasn't that uh, a biblical commandment came down and there were acts of the Lord that said this is time for the creation of the, that's supposed to be an almighty decision. That's not supposed to be a secular thing. This was done under the pressure of the Holocaust of World War II, that there had to be a safe area. And it seems to me that these policies and the overt expansionist policies pursued by Netanyahu have have left uh, the notion of Jewish security and areas, Jewish security more isolated, more alienated than any time that I can remember. Uh, and and yet there's splendid indifference to this by American politicians, by lobbyists that claim to speak for uh, the Jewish people. That somehow, once again, this will all blow over, and and what I I'm I'm getting is says no, this is a game changer, in a fundamental way. Now you have a lot more experience interpreting this region and the world situation than I do regarding Israel and, and the Arab world. What, what is your assessment? Well, I don't think it has anything. Uh, I I think that the ambitions of Netanyahu and Smotrich and Ben Gavir and and others in that cabinet don't have anything to do with security for Jews. Uh, they're about about their power. Uh, it's it's a... No, no, I mean not that they care about the security of Jews. I mean their actions threaten the security of Jews. Well, well sure they, they do. But, but I'm, what I'm saying is that the, the discourse of, of Western politicians and, and many journalists, uh, public figures, uh, accepts the claims of the Netanyahu cabinet to be standing for the security of Jews. Uh, and it's a false claim. Uh, they don't care about that. It's, I mean, Netanyahu, uh, uh, you know, didn't even care about the hostages that were in the hands of Gaza. He didn't care enough about the hostages to do basic kinds of negotiation uh, that would free them. Uh, he doesn't care. And uh, so, of course, what, what these people are doing is that they're claiming to act on behalf of the Jewish uh, community of the world. And then they're claiming th that, that only their strength, which is to say their fascist ag aggression, can protect Jews. Uh, and these are contradictory claims uh, that uh, certainly will, will have a negative fallout for, for ordinary Jews. Uh, and uh, I, I personally think that, uh, uh, that the entire idea of, of Zionism and uh, the idea of the necessity of a Jewish state in order to guarantee Jewish safety uh, is being brought into question uh, by the rise of Jewish supremacy uh, in, the, in the government of Israel. Uh, because that's clearly not contributing to the welfare of, of Jews. And um, uh, most American Jews in a, 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 a secular, democratic, uh, uh, non-Jewish system are much safer and much more prosperous and uh, have better prospects uh, than uh, right now than Israeli Jews do, where 40,000 businesses have come gone under. The uh, credit rating of Israel has fallen from A++ to B-. Minus minus. Uh, credit is going to be hard to, to get. Uh, some people are, are contemplating emigrating. Uh, this is not. The 150,000 people in the, in, in, in the South were, were, uh, couldn't go back to their homes. In the North, 70,000 people couldn't go back. And it's the, the, the militarism, on the uh, kind of ultimate uh, goals of, of Netanyahu, of, of the extreme goals of Netanyahu to completely control uh, the lives of people in Gaza and the West Bank and, and, and Lebanon uh, are, are endangering uh, the lives of ordinary Jews. They're not making them safer. Uh, so I, I expect that there's going to be a crisis in Zionism, uh, which many American Jews opposed until the Holocaust was known. 
Uh, and I think you see a reemergence of that pre-Holocaust Jewish uh, um, uh, questioning of, of, of Zionism as an ideology. And I think you see this with uh, people like Peter Beinart already uh, in the American Jewish uh, community. And I think, you know, even ordinary uh, non-Jewish Americans, uh, people like uh, Tanahisi Coates, who had been a big supporter of Israel, uh, all he needed was a week and a half in places like Hebron in the West Bank for him to come back and say, well, this is Jim Crow. Uh, and I don't think that most American Jews want to be associated with a system that produces a Jim Crow. So th these are uh, heady times. So the Middle East is being reshaped, but I think also important political identities are being reshaped and uh, the Jewish American community won't be immune from these processes. You wanted to keep this uh, interview short, so we're going over. Okay, I just so I'm going to conclude it with the way I began. The Israel that I visited at the time of the Six Day War, and I did interview some very prominent people. I even briefly, uh, Diane and Alon and others and so forth, was an Israel that where at least the people I talked to predicted that if you become a permanent occupier of other people, you will destroy your own idealism. And I think this conversation uh, confirms that. So let me just throw that in as a final note. Thank you for doing this, Juan Cole, when I think the leading expert in this country on uh, Iran and uh, the larger Middle East. I'm sure there are others that could make that claim, but just as someone who's writing and insights have held up, but unfortunately, Unfortunately, your insights and writings and predictions have held up. I wish it was a more cheerful world and that you had been wrong, but you are unfortunately right. Uh, I want to thank Christopher Ho and Laura Kondaragian at the terrific NPR station in Santa Monica, KCRW, for hosting hosting these shows. Uh, Joshua Shear, uh, who got Juan Cole and uh, insisted we do this this week. Our executive producer, Diego Ramos, who writes the introduction. Max Jones, who does the video. The JKW Foundation, in memory of a writer and a public intellectual, Gene Stein, uh, who was one of the first that I ever encountered uh, when I came back after the Six-Day War, who really warned about the dangers of an occupation. She was an associate of uh, Edward Said in his comments on that. And I want to thank, uh, thank the Integrity Media Foundation for supporting progressive journalism and giving us some assistance. Uh, that's it for this edition of Sheer Intelligence. See you next week.